Welcome to episode 12 with Javier Perez Caram. Where meditation meets daily life, this is the Meditation Freedom Podcast. Our next guest is going to be talking a little bit about his insight after pondering and meditating on death. I have this quote that I once in a while look at myself that reminds me of uh, how fleeting everything is. This is a quote from Paul Bowles from The Sheltering Sky. Death is always on the way, but the fact that you don't know when it will arrive seems to take away from the finiteness of life. But because we don't know, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. Yet everything happens a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood? Some afternoon that's so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it. Perhaps four or five times more. Perhaps not even. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps twenty, and yet it all seems limitless. Thank you so much for tuning in and checking out this podcast. My name is Hiko Rode. Today's interview is going to be with Javier Perez Caram. Javier grew up in Venezuela and relocated to New York in 2002 to pursue a filmmaking career. And in the process, he discovered meditation and Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, and he started to incorporate this practice into his daily life. And since then, he's gained a new purpose with his film career as a director and producer as well as his recently found drive to teach and share his experiences with meditation within a framework of Buddhist philosophy and its application to the modern life. In terms of his film company, he founded Green Carrot, which is a storytelling and production company with a mission to tell stories which are designed to connect with people at an emotional level. And together with this company, Green Carrot, he's currently in production of a multi-platform documentary called The Perfection of Giving, which is a sociological and anthropological exploration of the act of giving, the benefits for society and individuals, and then the practical consequences of a generous mind. And we'll talk about that in this interview. And when Javier is not working, he enjoys doing yoga, cooking with his friends, and traveling. And he also likes to volunteer. With that, let's get right into the interview with Javier Perez Caram. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Javier. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to talk to you and find out how you got to meditation. And that's usually how I start with these podcasts. So maybe you can tell a little bit about what brought you uh, to a meditation practice. You know, was there any particular event or maybe multiple events or? Sure, yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's funny because um, I guess my my relationship with meditation have started with a very non spectacular event. Um, I was chasing a lady. <laughs> That's really how everything started. I, there was this girl whom I liked, and we had been seeing each other, and she invited me to to a Buddhist meditation class, and I said yes because you never say no in the first few dates, right? Um, and. Then that day when I got to this class, uh, it was a uh, Geshe Michael Roach uh, from the Tibetan Gelugpa tradition, one of the first Westerners to get a Geshe degree in that tradition, the one teaching the class. Okay, and so by Roach you mean the, the name of the person? Yeah, Geshe Michael Roach. That's okay. his name, Michael okay. Roach. Um, depending on who you talk, he go, uh, uh, they will call him Geshe or not Geshe, which is an honor- honorary degree on the Tibetan tradition. He's a very, very polarizing person, so it uh, you know depends on who you talk with, they have their own opinion about it. Uh, mm-hmm. But this was my very first teacher. He was the person who started putting um, the seeds of meditation in my brain, and it was the person that started uh, putting names to things like karma and mindfulness and emptiness, which in a way were concepts that I already had grasped uh, from my own experience. I just didn't have any framework to put them in. Um, 
so I met these people. They called them Buddhist, and they meditated every day, and they completely uh, vouched for it, and they were completely like meditation is what's going to le lead you to enlightenment and to the best version of your own self. And, you know, I think that through that moment, I had just recently broken up uh, an engagement, and I, my parents were going through divorce. So, although I didn't know I was sad, I was certainly looking for something, and this showed up in my life, and mm -hmm. I decided to give it a try. Why not, right? Like, I, I am a, 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 what my fiancé calls an experienced junkie. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was like, "Oh, meditation! You know, let's see, let's see if it works. Let's give it a try." And uh, wow, that was eight years ago, and now like I am, it's part of my daily life. It took many years to become part of my daily life, but it did. It changed. It, it really like radically changed the way I perceive my my reality. Not meditation alone, but also a whole framework around it from the Buddhist and Tibetan Buddhism point of view. So yeah, I think that that's my story and how I started with it. Yeah, so so you mentioned some of these these sad things that happened and was how did the meditation help you with that with those events? Uh I think that not not meditation in itself helped me with the events, but in this case of like overcoming sadness and it didn't really help me overcome sadness, it kind of like helped me accept sadness. Mhm. Mm as part of like, okay, this is what it's going on right now, and it's okay to feel like that. Um, and these are the things that we can do for it not to feel so strong later. Um, mm. or, or that's how I understood it. I kind of like, through a practice of meditation and practice off of the cushion uh, in mindfulness in living, I was able to identify what I was feeling and how it made me react to 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 my world, right? Like going through a broken engagement and seeing your parents divorce, uh, uh, or well, I didn't leave it very closely because they were getting divorced in Venezuela. I was in New York, so um, it was more sporadically over the phone. I was not living the reality, but it hurt me very much. Like I remember when my mom telling me, uh, "Your dad and I are getting divorced." I felt physical pain in my chest. And it was a pain that I had no way to relate to anything else because I had never feel physical pain from sadness like that. Uh, and, you know, I identifying that pain and realizing that it exists and then trying to, um, again, yeah, not necessarily like tame it, but understand it and not allow that pain to become part of everything else because I all of a sudden I started finding myself objectifying women and rejecting uh, love and all this stuff and it was not coming really from from my own experience with women but it was coming from these broken relationships that were appearing in my life mm. and I was protecting myself from it and through meditation I realized that I was putting up that barrier and uh, and was able to break it down and that was like a very first experiment because then after that I realized my uh, clinginess for possession and I realized some inadequacies that I had in, uh, in other places and the, the trick there was to find what was the problem in your life and n just observe it and accept it as it is and all of a sudden it starts reframing itself and it's not a problem anymore but an opportunity right mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's how that's how how it helped me to cope with all of that if it makes any sense yeah yeah were there, maybe uh, were there any particular practices that helped you you know and that you um maybe that that you found particularly helpful with that particular struggle you had? Yes. Um, I, f I uh, bought this book called The Tibetan Book of Meditation, which was written by Lama Christie. I don't remember her, her last name right now, but I'll find it out and I'll email it to you. Okay. Um, and uh, also a very controversial figure, but in this, in this book, the very first meditation, if it's a death meditation. Um, about how to, not about how to, right, but through a series of visualizations, you try to simulate 
what it means for you to die and see how your possessions and your loved ones stay behind regardless of your dying and you cannot take anything with you. And it also plays with the idea of the uncertainty in the time of death. Um, and that wake up thing, like it, it, I always lived thinking of death as something very far away, very, um, you know, in, in a way, it, one likes to think that it's not going to happen to us, but right. we're all, all going to die. Right. <laughs> That's like the only certainty. Um, and, you know, we, we don't pay attention to that certainty. And I started doing this meditation over and over and over and over again, and it started making me appreciate the moment that we have so precious and like the, the shortness of the human life in respect of everything else and the fact that I am experiencing it it's just mind-blowing and 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 it is my choice on how I experience it and it is my choice whether I decide to love or to objectify women and it is my choice whether I decide to um, cheat on paperwork or be honest about it and you know like there's so many things that are going to condition how this experience as a human is going to unfold and it's all based on the choices I make now mm -hmm. and, and it was through death meditation that I realized all that I right. think that had I not found that death meditation uh, when I did it's, it's funny how things just find us when they have to but had I not found that death meditation when I did it would have not triggered a deeper practice because my practice really fired up on that realization of my own mortality. And mm -hmm. I didn't have any like close to death experience or anything. It was all through like sitting down and self-analysis. So in a way, I'm lacking that experiential thing that I see many people uh, have had and woken up with. But, you know, like through self-analysis, I, I, I was able to reach an interest and a deep, a, a need to understand more of our own reality and how my mind creates that reality mm -hmm. through the death meditation. And, and was there also a sense of what the consequences are if you go, you know, like you mentioned earlier, if you cultivate intimacy versus objectifying a woman in your in the case where you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, completely. There's a, there's a, it, through the understanding of cause and effect or karma on the Buddhist mindset, you start realizing how, how every action that you take, uh, as small as it seems, or sometimes even um, convenient as it seems, it, it has repercussions that are n most of the time not immediate, right? There's mm -hmm. just things that also all of a sudden show up years later, you know, like still right now when some things happen, like, I can perfectly, well, may, maybe not sometimes perfectly, but many times I can recall um, things that I did similar to those that are happening to me when I was maybe a teenager or like in college years. And I'm like, wow, you know, like it, 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 it's obvious that it's happening to me because I created that in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, who else would it happen to, you know? It's a, it's a very interesting thing once you start learning about karma and cause and effect and start realizing how it unfolds in your life. Right, and, and, it, and, it wants, and it makes you more conscious about what direction you want to take with your life and all your actions, right? Completely, and that's, I think that's also where, where mindfulness comes into play very strongly uh, because it's very easy to sit down and breathe and think about, oh, you know, like I need to do this and do that. But then like you go out to reality and you're in a long commute and people cut you off and you have a fight with somebody at work. And that's where the practice really takes shape mm -hmm. in real life, not so much in sitting down. Right. Um, and, and if you're not mindful on your day to day performance, you're bound to make mistakes, very, very terrible mistakes. Because we tend to do something and then go like, oh, I should have not done that. Right. And the idea of being mindful is like the moment you have the impulse or, or the urge to do something, go like, oh, wait, there's this urge here. There's this impulse here. I'm not going to surrender to it. I'm going to take a second to look at it and decide whether I'm going to surrender to it or not. Yeah. And if you're not mindful and you don't practice mindfulness on your day-to-day -day life, aside from just meditating, you, yeah, that, that danger of committing that mistake is so high, so high. Yeah, and then you're more likely to have regrets too. Completely, yeah.
And yeah. regrets are terrible, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, Joseph Campbell, one of my favorite quotes is Joseph Campbell says, regret is delayed illumination. And in a way, by mindfulness and meditation practice, we have that, we give that ch a chance to be illuminated about something before we act, and the action may cause, have, you know, unbeneficial consequences. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it really is something that, we just go about life without realizing how mm -hmm. we think we get away with stuff, but we know we didn't. Like we, when we know we did it, we already didn't get away with it because we're constantly judging ourselves right. from what we just did. Yeah. Whether we did bad or wrong, that's our judgment. Oh, I'm good or I'm bad. And that stays with you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and talk, and since you mentioned judging, has that changed uh, about in your practice, uh, with your practice too? Do you feel. Like you've get, you've you've got more compassion for yourself and for others as a result of practice. Yes, um, yes. I think that first more for others than for myself. And it's just lately in the last year or two that I have been able to build compassion towards myself. Not that before I hated myself. But the idea of self-compassion and self-respect, um, it's, I think it's uh, for such individ individualistic society that we're here in the West, we don't really teach as a society to love ourselves very much. Mm -hmm. we, li we teach uh, of indulgence and a lot of that, but to like respect and love ourselves, to understand that, uh, you know, making a mistake is not negative necessarily. Um, to to understand that we are allowed to fail, and it doesn't end there. It, we 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 don't have that as as our culture, or at least I didn't. And the idea of self compassion has been difficult to grasp. Now, compassion for others has been like from the beginning. It was just too obvious because when somebody tells you that karma is the rule of cause and effect and what you do to somebody else will come back to you then of course I have to be kind to everybody else right and of course I have to be loving to everybody else because that's what I want so in a way that self-compassion is almost self I mean that compassion towards other it's almost self-serving but it still works it still helps people and it still helps you and it still makes the world and the experience in the world a better experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, that's my experience with compassion. Lately, I have been uh, uh, practicing more the doing Tong Len meditation with my future self, the, the practice of giving and taking in, in Tibetan Buddhism. And... I think that has triggered a little, a little bit more of like, okay, you know, it's okay for me to, to in a way, not be where I wanted to be. Because when you're like in your fifteen, when you're fifteen, you think that you know, your thirties, you're gonna be this one thing, and you arrive to your thirties, and I'm like, oh, I'm not what I thought I was gonna be. So I'm probably a failure, right? Uh, and it, and it's not like that. It's not true. We're not what we think we are. Right. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Has that changed your, your, your sense of who you think you are? Has that changed a lot over the Completely, yeah. yeah, yeah, completely. You know, like I am um, I started my my life, my adult life as a filmmaker, like the artist kind of uh, concept. I like I had a message I had to put out, and there were like all these stories that I wanted to make, and they uh, and they were all self serving. I I was not doing anything for anybody else but for me. These were things I wanted to do and things I needed to do. It didn't matter if anybody else cared for the story or the idea at all. It was completely about me doing it. And when I started, uh, well, meditating and practicing Buddhism and in, in that framework, practicing compassion and practicing as much wisdom and learning as much of wisdom as, I, as we can, um, my... Well, first, my, my filmmaking career has not necessarily taken a backseat, but it doesn't define me anymore. Like, if you'd asked me five years ago, who is Javier? My first answer would be, I'm a filmmaker, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that was, like, it somehow, like, would encompass everything else. And today, I am not a filmmaker. That's something that I do, but it's not the only thing I do. 
Mm-hmm. And what I do doesn't define me anymore. Right now, I feel more of like a human being, a, a, a future husband, a future father. I'm like in another, a, a, in a completely different framework. For some reason, I now the stories that I tell through video, which I still do, I still do film and video, but those stories are more oriented to what, or I feel are more oriented to what the world needs and what is going to inspire inspire other people to become the best version of themselves. Mm, yeah, that's that's interesting. So maybe we can go into from from here to the the film you're working on right now and you can sure, explain yeah. a little bit more about that. What what is it what is it called and and how did you come up with with it? Wow, okay, yeah. Uh, so the film I'm working on right now, we recently finished the post production. Now we're going into the f- uh, festival circuit. The film is called The Perfection of Giving. Um, it's uh, it's a documentary film, and it was shot uh, between Nepal, Kathmandu, and New York City. And it is a project that, in a way, kind of l- fell on my laps. There was this uh, small organization that started by one of my close teachers called the 108 Lives Project. And it was a project to help out uh, 108 uh, beggars and orphan kids in Kathmandu. Uh, So he was gathering some people in New York to do it, and the idea was to hopefully replicate that project in many other places. And he wanted to document it in video, and uh, there was somebody already in charge of the video, and I kind of like offered my help. And... As I'm documenting, because the idea was to document it and make like five minute pieces to show to people to raise money and nothing like really ambitious. But as I was helping the organization become what it is right now, which is a little bigger, it's still not a massive organization, but they have uh, operations now in New York, Kathmandu, Argentina, Australia, so it has grown in a way, but as I started helping them, and as I started seeing the other volunteers help, um, our attitude towards everything started changing, and you know, it, it's it's funny to think that we were probably spending one or two hours a day where instead of thinking about our needs and the things w- that would make us happy, we were actually thinking about the needs and the things that would make happy these 108 people who we didn't know. And still, that hour a day of thinking of somebody else was somehow making us so happy, like brutally happy. <laughs> And and I was like, oh, there's something here. Like, you know, like maybe altruism is not so much about helping somebody else, but about helping yourself. Maybe we go to these remote places as rich Westerners and uh, to actually find ourselves and not so much to build schools, which we do. And it's great. I'm not trying to disregard that. Mm-hmm. But but we we like... The truth is that, for example, in Kathmandu, when we were making the perfection of giving, we were there for 30 days in our first round. And we go there and we help paint schools and we teach the kids some English. And and then we take our staff and we come back to New York or to Germany or Australia or wherever uh, the other volunteers were coming from. And they stay there with their own problems and their own issues and their own illnesses and their own afflictions. And we come back to our own life. Sure, there is an exchange that happens and it's beautiful, but their life still is pretty much the same with a little attachment. Our experience as human beings completely changed. Mm. Um, so that's the, 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 the story behind the documentary of the perfection of giving. How a group of 10, 15 volunteers all of a sudden changed their experience as humans by helping this 108 people, which ended up being more like 700 people uh, in, in Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, that was. It's a very personal film, um, so although it's not told from my point of view. Like I was part of the organization that 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 made everything, and these people who we see change in the film are actually my friends, and uh, it's uh, these are people that I still see on on weekly basis. Uh, so it's still very personal, and 
You know, I think it comes across like that. It comes across as as my own personal experience. Let's see how it plays out in the th in well, not the theaters, in the festivals, and then uh, after the festival run, probably like at the end of the summer, we're gonna put it online for it to be available for everybody to watch, and. I think it's going to be nice. I think it's going to inspire some people to do some crazy self, I mean, non-self-interesting things. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned non-self, which is going to be to someone not familiar with Buddhism is going to be confusing. But you're talking really about the boundary between self and other and, and how in Buddhism that, that boundary is not, it's kind of a fictitious boundary right correct yeah that's exactly what i'm talking about um the 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 blurry line between me and him or between me and you mm -hmm. uh that 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 according right like you say according to buddhist f uh, f uh, framework it's an illusion created by our own duality of mind uh, and it, it, it's crazy because when you put yourself in a very generous position Again, in a Buddhist framework, uh, one would say when you start playing the Bodhisattva, um, it, those boundaries just blur. Like it, it, and when you see somebody in pain, like it pains you. And when you see somebody laughing, you cannot help but to laugh. Mm -hmm. And those connections are so strong, so strong. Yeah, and is that one of the reasons you called it the perfection of gi giving? Yes, in, in 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 for me it became part of that practice. Uh, the uh, the in Tibetan Buddhism we have the the six perfections. Uh, I think Theravada Buddhism has ten, uh, which I'm just learning about Theravada Buddhism lately. But um, the the first perfection in Tibetan Buddhism is the perfection of generosity or the perfection of giving, um, and it's precisely about that about just. Uh, blurring that space between what's mine and what's others, including our body and our souls, or our body and our minds, um, and and overcoming those boundaries to like have access to the oneness, right? Right. Um, I don't claim that I have actually experienced that all the way, uh, but the, certainly the the experience that we lived in the movie was at least a little taste of what that really means. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and so in, 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 the, in the West, typically with giving, you have a giver and a receiver. But like you said, there's a, there's a blurring of that. And it, there's not so much like someone out here and then someone out there that's getting, a, that's receiving something. It's more, you know, somebody who's, who sees their identity as everybody and everything and the giving the the self and other dissolves in that giving and receiving right completely yes completely like that that's uh it, it's because giving it's a full circle it, it, it's like you say here in the west we're just like caught up in like oh i gave and they took and that's it that's the end of the process but there's somebody taking on the other side mm -hmm. and for that person to be taking the it, it immediately is giving that experience to the who we think the giver is, and it becomes uh, uh, an, in, an interdependent arising, right? From mm -hmm. the dependent origination, it can, there cannot be giving without receiving. There are two sides of the same coin. Right, and, and there's an equality about it that we also don't necessarily see in the West. In the West, it's more like, well, you know, the, the person who's giving is just slightly better than the person who's receiving, and and I think what you're getting at is also that that's not that's not true. That's a delusion. Completely, yes, yes. I think that is true too. The mm -hmm. the way you put it. Getting back to the movie. So when when do you plan to? When do you think this will all be finished? Well, the movie is finished. As the movie, it's it's already done, uh, uh, completely ready to show. We actually have had already two private screenings here in New York for the people who who participated in the film. And it's going to be out to the public really depends on how the festival run goes. I was I didn't want to send it to festivals because I just wanted to show it to people, but everybody around me was like, "Hey, you know, like if you send it to festivals, then you will gain some kind of credibility and more people might want to see it." So 
for the goodness of all those people who would not see it unless it goes to festivals, I decided to actually send it to festivals. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it will reach more of an audience. So I'm thinking that probably uh, around September this year is going to be available fully for everybody to watch. You can go to theperfectionofgiving.com. Okay. Uh, that's our website. And you can take uh, sign up for the newsletter there if you want. I am not sending newsletters regularly, just when something very important happens, like festivals or releases. So anybody who wants to know when this uh, film about generosity comes out, please do come and sign up so you find out when you can actually download it and watch it. Great. Yeah, and I'll make sure there's a link on the on the show notes as well so people can find it again. And Thank you. The last thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is uh, that you also are a teacher, right? You're teaching I am, meditation. I am both a teacher and a student, yes. I guide meditation at the Three Jewels in New York City every Friday morning and some other mornings during the week, depending on other teachers who are not uh, available. Like this Monday and next Monday, I'm sobbing for somebody there. But yeah, in uh, the Three Jewels in New York City, um, they offer meditation Mondays, lunches, and at nights. And they also have Buddhism classes there. I am one of the junior teachers there. Uh, that's where I have studied for the last eight years of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that I know about meditation and Buddhism, aside from other connections with uh, now the Shambhala tradition. I'm studying right now under, under a Shambhala teacher too. And... Yeah, I, I I teach there every Friday morning. Sorry, I'm going to circle back. I teach there every Friday morning, um, mostly mindfulness meditation and uh, giving and taking meditation, the Tonglen meditation that I mentioned a little while ago. Those are very easy meditations for beginner meditators, which is what I get the most. And... Uh, one is based uh, on breath and the other one has visualizations. So I think it plays out very well for, for both uh, people, both approaches to meditation. Mm -hmm. Some people just like to breathe. Some people like to imagine. I kind of like to give them a little bit of both in, in those sessions in, on Friday mornings. And currently, I am also doing, like I said, I, I studying under a Shambhala teacher. I'm doing a, an immersive meditation teacher training for a year. So um, at a place called the Interdependent Project in New York City, uh, I'm studying basically with other 25 meditation teachers and we guide each other in meditation and we give feedback to each other in meditation and we explore the different kinds of meditations and the different kinds of instructions under several lineage of the Buddhist tradition to play around with that and build more skills to guide our groups in meditation, hopefully to a better experience That's as great. humans. Yeah. Is there, is there any particular meditation that you see in, in your, your particular neck of the woods in New York City that it would is the most helpful for the people uh in new york in that have very very busy busy distracting lives what, what would you what would you tell them well the, if you don't have any experience with meditating or you're just starting i would recommend anybody to breathe and just focus on that at first and focus on don't beat yourself up when you're not focused on the breathing because that's another thing that New Yorkers do a lot. Oh, no, I can't breathe. Well, I'm just leaving. No, no, no. Just <laughs> <laughs> take yeah. a second. Your, your mind's going to wander somewhere else and bring it back to your breath. That's if you like you have to do that, even if you do it badly in order to really gain benefits from any other meditation. Right. right. I think I, I, I might be wrong, but in my experience and in the experience of the people that I have instructed, you're better off learning how to breathe first and then try to go into anything else. Yeah, I think that's good good advice, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been What great. would you recommend? What would I recommend? Yeah. Pro I probably I would go with a breath as well at first because that's that's what we carry with us everywhere we go. You know, that's what yeah. keeps us alive and and uh especially 
taking nice deep breaths once in a while because so many of us are tend to start breathing shallower and shallower because the the pace of life and everything is so crazy that um, we don't even allow ourselves to take a deep breath anymore. Yeah, you know, I so. agree. I agree. One hundred percent. Yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you, Javier. Talking to you too, Seiko. Thank you so much for for having me on. It's an honor. Great. Thank you. Is there any other websites that people can go to besides the perfectionofgiven.com for your documentary? Sure. I have a website where I uh, I, I, blo I blog about mindfulness and productivity um, to not just be fully mindful, but actually use it to do something productive with your life for society and for yourself. Uh, it's called ourbusyminds.com. I just recently started this a couple of months ago, so there's not a lot there, but there is audio guided meditation and some like uh, productivity tips, and it's getting packed up with some more stuff that I have learned in the last five, eight years of my life that I find very valuable for me and others. So I'm just sharing it there out there with people to take advantage of what I have learned too. Great. Yeah, and I checked it out, and it looks great. Thank so. you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode with Javier Perez Caram. And you can find out more about him and his website and so forth through the resources page for the show notes for this particular episode. And you can do that by going to meditationfreedom.com slash 12. Leave a comment if you, find, if you found any of it interesting. And I'm curious too. I'm going to see if I can get somebody who's listening from New Zealand to say something because I noticed on my stats, which I'm not sure if I can believe any of them, I noticed some people were listening from all the way from New Zealand. Some people were in Auckland and some in Wellington. Maybe somebody can comment or leave a note or send a tweet. And if you send a tweet, it's at R-O-O-D-S-I-C-C-O. -C -C I'm just curious to see if I can get somebody who's listening to uh, send a little note or leave a reply on the website, on the webpage that I just mentioned. Or perhaps even uh, go to iTunes and leave a review or something. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Uh, anyway, next week I'll be talking with Lisa Hamilton of the Conscious Runner website. And she's working on a book and I'm going to be asking a little bit more about her meditation in motion, as she calls it, since she's not a sitting meditator. So I think her perspectives on meditation are interesting because a lot of us associate meditation with sitting meditation. And of course, there is meditation possible in every action that we do. So please check out episode 13 next week. Well, that's all I've got for today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. And until next week, take care. Thank you so much for joining us on the Meditation Freedom Podcast where meditation meets daily life.